Welcome to the Fusion Party of Australia Member Profile Podcast. You're very welcome. Take up a seat and listen to what they have to say. Thanks for joining me, Ron. Ron is a new member to the Fusion Party. And so we're sitting down with him just to get to know him a little bit, where he comes from, where he lives, why he decided to join the Fusion Party, and just a little bit about his everyday life experience as well. So thank you, Ron. Hello. Yes. Nice to meet you all. Would you like to introduce yourself? Just a quick recap of who you are. Yeah, sure. So my name is Ron Dagan. I'm uh, originally from coming from Israel. I um, lived in Australia for about 16 years now. I'm married. I got three children. I'm a mechanical engineer by profession. I've been working the past 13 years in the mining and resources industry here in Western Australia. I'm still working, but not as much as I used to. I've been involved in fly in, fly out. Um, on my side, mainly on maintenance side of things. This is my background. Yes. Okay, great. Um, and so you recently joined us and you said you heard about the Fusion Party after going to a secular meeting. Is that right? Yes. So uh, in the past three or months or so, I'm uh, attending Zoom meetings organized like in a, like a meetup. Mm-hmm. And they're coming from the Humanist Society it's about uh, secularism and humanism. I was born Jewish. I was born with Jewish tradition, Jewish culture, but I was never religious. But now even more so, I like left completely the Jewish religion and I left with no, no religion identity. And um, I'm interested in finding alternatives to religious gathering, religious identities, religious communities in a more secular way. So this was my motivation of joining that Zoom meetings on meetups. Of so That's how I've heard about Fusion. Yeah. Um, well, and when we were speaking yeah. about uh, moving away from your religious connections and community, there's that immediate mm. loss of losing community. And that's pretty much the thing that everyone wants and desires and, and holds dear. And, and can mm-hmm. be quite strong in the religious communities as well. I agree. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then we started to explore the idea of secular communities. I thought that's a really good idea because the thing is, from what I hear from people when they leave their religions is they miss community is the immediate thing. And and while the community is bound by the beliefs and the scriptures and then the rites and rituals that they do in the religion, you can have a community that just exists independent of that. But it's a really good, I guess, backbone interwoven fiber for holding the community together. But it seems like it's it's like a side excuse. People enjoy the community. I don't think they're really there to read whatever they're reading. It's for the community. Definitely, I I, I can I can agree with that. Yes, yes. Yeah, but and so the, more people- the ritual and the, the context of the religious books and and what they offer. They're like the glue that hold the community, but really it's the social interaction that's happening there, which is very important, which is, for me, it's my biggest loss. It's more of the social interactions, yes, because we are social creatures and hmm. we all need that, yes. Yeah, it would be really good to to learn more in general about how to build the communities we want and how to build healthy communities. I mean, we all know that there are definite um, religious groups and clubs that we can all join, but it'd be really nice if people knew how to create their own one and make sure it's healthy and functioning healthily. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. And then you heard about the fusion party through going to that meetup. Did they say much about it? I was inquiring about secular community. How do we build secular politics? That was my one of my questions there. Mm-hmm. Uh, secular society, secular political structure. Mm-hmm. And then they've recommended about two parties. One of them is called... Um, Reason. Reason, yes. Thank you. Yeah. I tried contact Reason, but no much success. I don't think they're much active. Oh, okay. Yeah. I, I'm not sure, but I didn't have success. Mm-hmm. Send an email, didn't got a reply back, tried to call, but the call did not was not successful. And then they've uh, also mentioned fusion, and that's how it was. So ah, okay. Good to hear. When I, well, and I read I read the, uh, the website, Fusion website, uh, what fusion is all about, what fusion stands for, and I really liked it. So it's maybe a good opportunity to say. Yeah, well, thank so, you. And it's really good yeah. to have you. And and that's why we're having this interview now. Um, because I, I found our chat really good. We discussed a lot of the things that were important to you and came up with some new ideas for things. 
And then we, we spoke about what you do. So you work in mining. Can you please tell me just the very basics of that? Because I don't work in mining. So you yeah, said sure. something about um, you help close down mine sites. I, I work in iron ore. Mm -hmm. So mining is a very broad, very broad industry. It's a huge um, and it's very different. So when we say mining, it depends what commodity and how we mine it. And it's all very, very different. Um, it can be underground mining, it can be above the ground mining, uh, which is called open cut. And then in mining itself, there's all sorts of so many different disciplines and type of engineering and sciences. Mm -hmm. So it's really is a huge industry, but it's the common thing is it's all about the planet Earth resources, yes, that human actually use. If if you turn the light, the, the, the electricity go through copper wires. Mm -hmm. in every household in Australia. So it really is a very um, fundamental <laughs> part of our daily life. Which oh, definitely. Because really we may be expected to accept, accept it for granted, but we really can't live our life without it. Yeah, that's um, where we get our resources from. And so you said you yeah, work yeah. in iron ore. Yep. Um, yeah. And we were talking about there's different environmental demands when it comes to mining different resources. Yeah, so mining is a dirty industry, meaning it to mine, you have to interact with planet Earth and modify the ecosystem, mm -hmm. uh, in, in, interact with the ecosystem, modify it and interrupt with it, whether we like it or not, this is what it is. Um, mm -hmm. And not all now, mining is created equally. Not all mining is created equally, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Some mm -hmm. mining processes are very disturbing mm -hmm. and some less. They all involve blasting, digging you know, on massive scale, material handling. Mm -hmm. uh, it would be yeah, interesting yeah. to have a look at the environmental and emissions impact of different types of mining. So mining for lithium, mm. mining for cobalt. Um, cobalt has been getting a little bit of attention lately. Do you mm -hmm. Have you been following that as well? Not much, but uh, I've been involved in the past in nickel, nickel mining. Mm-hmm which is same same but different is but it's same as because it has mining is is just one part of nickel production there's after that there's a refinery there's a chemical plant to leach the the nickel out of the ore mm -hmm. to extract it it's a chemical process that's completely different to iron ore that is very dangerous and also very polluting mm. so what do you do yeah. in your day to day with your iron ore mining role so I'm a mechanical engineer. I that can be very different from a role to role. But I, what, what I'm involved with is, is is maintenance, uh, shutdowns, shutdown planning, and uh, some of the execution. Mm -hmm. uh, but 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 mainly before before the shutdown starts, it's it's the budgeting of it, it's the timing, time frames, and the scope of work that needs to be done. What are we going to do? Uh, how much? How long is it going to take? and how much money it's going to cost, and what human resources we're going to need, these kind of things. I'm mainly involved in crushing and screening. That's my main, I've done it for, for years. So I'm, I'm shut down in crushing and screening plants and, and, material, and material handling. Did which you is say part of crushing the and screening? Yeah. So what happens is after the raw material has been blasted, yeah, and it goes on trucks, huge trucks, and then it goes to huge conveyor belts. That's been... And then the conveyor belts take the ore to a crushing and screening plant. So it's crushed the ore to a certain size. And then it's been screened, meaning other impurities, which are not ore, have been screened out. Mm -hmm. And then it's go through, uh, then it go, goes through other processes in the, on the way. But essentially, uh, then crushed ore is gathered into stockpile. Then it's, uh, it's loaded into the train. The train takes it to port. In the port, the, the ore goes into the ships. Ships take it to the client. Mm -hmm. All right. There, yes, so. China is where it goes to get refined. <laughs> For my understanding, they get they get the ore, mm -hmm. and then yes, they start manufacturing metal, mm -hmm. steel. Mm -hmm. So they have smelters and they heat it up, and then yeah, there's chemical process involved with that. But that's out of my scope. Mm. Okay, interesting. Yeah, and then and we buy um, the product back as as a. <laughs> We yes, buy the steel back from China. That's it. Well, I mean, uh, <laughs> yeah. in New South Wales, I, I went and visited Lithgow um, two years ago and I was reading about their steel works back in the day. I think it'd be good to have a lot more manufacturing here. I mean, 
Fusion oh, yeah. really wants to be Australia to be more self-sufficient. If you've been living under a rock and you haven't heard of what's going on with the weird nuclear subs deal and, and all this stuff about protecting our trade relationship with China, but we're protecting ourselves from China, very confusing. It highlights that we need to be less dependent if there's going to be that kind of unstable conflict going on. Yeah, imagine a war where all the bullets are made in China. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty much says, says it all. Yeah, true. Yeah. Someone has yeah. to make the bullets for everyone. Yeah. But if they make it, we're not going to get them. Mm, yeah. True. Yeah. Oh, you'd hope that we'd be the first to get them. That's tricky. Yeah. <laughs> That's a tricky one. But yeah, yeah, no, I am. Um, what you yeah. say in terms of we probably cannot rely on our natural resources only as a main industry mm -hmm. and just forget about every, anything else. That's the problem. Yeah. It's very extractive. It's very finite. There's an end point to that extraction. If we can at least keep the Correct. chain going and we, we smelt it and refine it and all of that here, then mm. um, yeah, we keep more of the industry and the more of the money here. I agree with that. Absolutely. And also what's happening is uh, we just sell the raw material, which we are very good at producing. Yeah? Australia is a very, mining industry is the top in the world in, in Australia. But if we do all that and we uh, become expert only on that, well, and other people do the manufacturing, what happens is they get the knowledge, they get the intellectual property and get to improve it and improve it and improve it and improve it. And then we just buy the material, we just buy, buy the product but the knowledge is not, we don't have the knowledge of how to do mm -hmm. it. They do. Information yeah, is power. Have you been part of a political party before? I never been part of a political party. That's my first time. I really, I really like what Fusion, Fusion stands for. And I might talk a little bit about it, what, why I made this decision. Mm -hmm. So I've said before the beginning, I said I've, I'm, I'm from Israel. And uh, originally my family's there. And at the moment, what's happening in, the, in Israel is there is a change in political structure. The government in Israel is very extreme. Uh, substantial of it is religious, the extreme side of religion. And there's a real threat of Israel democracy is becoming to an end. Not yet, but in the near future, it may happen. And uh, there's huge protests in Israel. Every weekend, you're talking about... 200,000 people in, at the street, things like that, wow. at that scale. Yeah, wow. 200,000, 200,000 people go, but it's all peaceful protest, mm -hmm. but very fierce, very, very uh, determined protest against this government and basically to stop the legislation they do. And this was in um, response to the fragility of democracy that you started to witness with um, very religious conservative people joining the Israeli government. Is that right? A year ago, there was an election in Israel and they went into power without, there was no transparency. So they didn't talk about any legislating any of these laws or changing the political structure before they got elected. The public opinion in Israel over the years, because uh, when I was a teenager, I remember there was a left-wing government in Israel. I, I voted left-wing. But over the years, the Israeli public opinion moved to the right wing. The only problem with this, not, not, not the only problem, but one of the problems with this is re extreme religious figures come with the right wing. Mm. And then now they're trying to, le to legislate religious laws to secular communities. So vast majority of Israelis, they're not, they're not religious at all. Mm -hmm. They might they might just be a little bit traditional, but they're not interested in religion. It's an interesting uh, thing what you're saying with about the extreme and the right wing and the religious, just mm. that intertwining of their belief systems and a strong community, which is also interwoven with those belief systems. And when they mm -hmm. start to overlap, I guess, religious beliefs with um, fascist beliefs and, and things like that can be very mm -hmm. dangerous when a group is aligned by their beliefs without question. I mean, it's okay to have beliefs, but I guess just at what point does it become oppressive? I that's exactly that's uh, that's that's exactly what's happening. 
So it's all very nice community and very nice fuzzy feeling, you know, you're together with your friends and mm. you eat together and you have your rituals and all of that. But in what point that becomes such a strong identity that it becomes us and them and that becomes, it pushes division into society. I think if they suppress any questioning, that's when it's troubling. I guess it's figuring out what is healthy questioning. You know, why Why do we believe this? Where did this belief come from? Why are we structured this way? And, and what is the moment when you realize, oh, I'm actually not very aligned with these beliefs and then have a safe departure, hopefully, from that community? Yes. It really is a social science question of how human interact and behave as a group. At least in the Jewish religion, in the Orthodox Jewish religion, I wish to be more, more precise, you're not really allowed to ask much. You just accept for granted what the religious text says and the religious laws that drive that been driven from the religious texts, you just follow them. Mm-hmm. Uh, you just listen to the rabbi. If you ask too many questions, well, it's a problem, yeah? <laughs> yeah. Um, so. Well, that makes for a very efficient community because no one's questioning. Because every time there's questioning, people have to stop and they have to explain and they have to, and it, it takes energy out. But if no one questions, then it's a very strong, stable, safe community when it comes to beliefs and, I guess, direction. So mm. they can easily tell them what to do and no one questions. But I think if you have... Too many people questioning, it becomes a dysfunctional organization, potentially. Yes, so, I must yeah. say the Jewish, the Jewish religion uh, in Israel had a lot of trouble taking over up, up until even this day. They didn't even, to, even though they're trying very, very hard, they uh, haven't succeeded even after this day to control the politics, entirely control the politics and legislate religious laws or tell people what to do. Maybe because actually the mentality of Israelis and Jewish Israelis is always doubt. (laughs) Yeah, that's a good thing. I mean, I'm just thinking about how in Australia, sometimes you see people say, oh, it is what it is, not in my business. It's um, the, they call it the bystander effect. It's when, you know, someone Mm -hmm. sees something happening. So someone's just having a heart attack on the footpath and in a busy street, most people are like, oh, that's okay. I'm sure their parents are nearby or. That's okay. I'm yeah. sure that person oh. next to them will do something. And I feel that that's, that's something that I see a lot. And I think that's a, a threat to um, integrity and accountability and transparency, which is a problem. Oh, I thought all these uh, Australians are quite smart about like understanding right from wrong. And there's, um, for my sort of feeling in Australia, there's a quite of a healthy trust between government and uh, and the public but the public's also so the public do comply with the government it's been asked to do a certain thing but then when it comes to election the 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 people here would not be shy to replace this government so now we've got labor but liberal was in power before and things like that so one choice or the other <laughs> but maybe i've got the wrong impression i'm not sure you know i'm not sure about that actually yeah, there, um, there has been some news that came out um, about PwC, who are a consulting firm. Do you know? Mm-hmm. Have you heard this? No, no. So, um, Please tell they, me. Yeah, yeah. they were quite embedded in a lot of government departments. So, the ATO and the Defense Department, lots of very expensive million, multi million dollar contracts with them that you could say allegedly didn't follow procurement procedure and weren't undergoing scrutiny. So yeah. they, they had their fingers in, in a lot of areas of government, but even to the point where the taxation board were having meetings mm-hmm. in PwC. <laughs> this ah. just came out today. So <laughs> it's just I insane. Can see now, PwC tax leaks scandal government cracks down on tax advisors. Mm. I can see the headlines. So, yes. See what you're yeah. talking about. Mm-hmm. So I think um mm. I think that's where there has to have been someone who knew that that was happening and didn't do anything about it or didn't tell mm. the right person or no one confronted it or no one said that that's probably a bit weird. Um, ah. And that's, that's an example of not questioning. I think it is nice to just have an easy day and avoid conflict and just be like, look, I'm just going to follow, focus on my scope and my, you know, narrow view, but 
I think if anything ever crosses anyone's attention and they know that it's not right, Mm -hmm. we should teach people how to deal with that, you know, how to Mm -hmm. handle that sense of responsibility and and who to tell. So luckily we have um, public interest disclosure laws that protect people if they do release information like that. So it's also known as the whistleblower laws. So if anyone Mm. sees anything wrong and and they call, call an alarm, um, they're not punished because they really shouldn't be. They're trying to do the best thing for the public. Right. I think we need we yes. need more empowerment when it comes to people feeling um, they can uphold transparency and accountability. Yeah. Mm. Just like in Israel. I agree. They question everything. The question and everything, yes. But in Israel, there's definitely lack of systems in place where here there's a lot more. Oh, yes. So Israel systems is are important. Mm. So in Israel, Israel is quite a, quite a new democracy. It's quite a new democracy. Israel, Israel exists only seventy years, seventy five years, and we said for seventy five years, Israel was a democracy. It still is, it still is. It hasn't collapsed yet, but but it's very easy to, or it's relatively easy, to take over Israel democracy and change it. And yes. that's what this government of in the moment in Israel is doing now. We're here. I think here there's a lot more, the democracy is a lot stronger in terms of the way it's structured. So there's a Senate. Oh, I see what you mean. Yes. System protections. Yeah. System, there's more checks and balances here. Mm. Um, uh, although <laughs> I hope people will not ch- try to change that as well. <laughs> yeah. Especially no. not extreme religious people. That's the yes. thing. Um, yes. So what I've noticed, what I've noticed in the past year, once the government has is changing, people are trying to change the system. And then there's real threat of democracy is under threat. Human rights is under threat. Minorities under threat. And, yeah. and, and it's mean, very dangerous. So I think it's really interesting. Um, and more people need to know more about what is democracy and what makes a healthy democracy, because there are many different parts of the democratic system and processes that could be compromised and undermined. Yeah, mm. so it is important. It is really good that we have that division of we've got the Senate, the the House of Review, and then we've got the um the executive. Upper house, lower house, yeah. Yeah, yep. all of them. So that's really good that we have that. Um, and we mm-hmm. have conflict of interest disclosure laws and um transparency, maybe could have better data collection and better reporting. There's just so mm. many elements. And I think Australia does have really good systems when it comes to voting. I mean, I don't think we'd ever doubt an election. We we wouldn't ever think an election was rigged, like just like what Trump was saying in America. Mm. But um I guess what we could criticize about Australian democracy is the uh influence of the media. Yeah. The the role of the media, I guess, is to inform accurately. That, that's really correct. becoming a bit uh, challenged lately. Media without bias. Yeah. And thing is, I read a little bit of uh, in the Infusion website about climate change and mm-hmm. uh, the importance of of acting on this issue. Mm-hmm. Let's say there's no people on the planet, zero people, zero human beings on the planet. Mm-hmm. If there's zero human being on the planet, there's no climate change problem. But because there's, I don't think we are nine billion. <laughs> It's the, the populations of planet Earth growing re- really exponentially, <laughs> not exponentially, but growing fa- really fast. Fast. Mm-hmm. Really, the problem of climate change, I think, lies with not much with the pollution that we make, but first with our political structure. First, how our political, how our politics in Australia and around the world is actually working, mm-hmm. um, because because climate change is not a local problem. You no. can't say, oh, okay, we'll solve the <laughs> climate global. change in Australia. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, and then we'll be fine. Hmm. If we know we're going to get to net zero. We're going to net, we're going to get to net zero, but it won't hmm. be fine if we have a war in Ukraine with um, Putin sort of um, trying to take over and threat, threat the entire, you know, threat Europe's really. Hmm. So that is really bad news for climate change, isn't it? You can't really solve climate change like this. Yeah, you can't when everyone is in chaos under conflict. They're they're like, well, let's fix this problem before, you know. Mm. But um, I don't want to be alarmist, but I've been hearing in the headlines, they're describing it now as global boiling. 
And, yes, I've heard that. Yep. <laughs> and yes. I mean, we've seen what's happening in Europe and even in Canada having um, fires. And I know it's summer there, but I mean, this is just like what happened when we saw the Delta virus running rampage um, overseas. And then it just came and, and came and affected us here. I think we're foreseeing what will happen over here in the summer with all that's happening in Europe and it's scary. And I think my biggest fear is I fear that we are not prepared. I think we've had quite a heads up, but I just, I don't see anyone getting us ready to be prepared to deal with this. And I think it's mm-hmm. really going to shock a lot of people. So fingers crossed, but yeah, <laughs> yes, it definitely yes. has to be a global coordinated um, yes. strategy, I, I globally agree. coordinated strategy. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I definitely agree. And that actually brings me back to a little bit to religion. Some of the religious values, like old school and out of diet, and we should really forget about them. Like, for example, there's a religious saying in, in Orthodox Jewish religion. It's not the entire thing, but it, you're meant to have big families, a lot of people, a lot of children, mm-hmm. seven kids, eight kids, 12 kids. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, is this what we need on this planet? More people? Hmm. I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> there are people who also have that line of thinking as well. Um, uh, like, uh, and, and sometimes people might refer to them as eco-fascists because people don't like the idea of telling others not to have babies for the good of the planet. And some people also argue that we have enough resources on the on the world to sustain people and, and things like that. But mm. I think it's a worthy thing to identify that we have to have a long-term sustainability plan, whether we have lots of people or not. I mean, birth rates are dropping and fertility is dropping and and people are worried about the the next generation not having enough people to do the work to keep the older people on, on a pension. Mm, true. <laughs> I agree with that too. I agree with that. Yes. it's. Yeah. I don't yeah, know. But yeah, I mean, I don't know. <laughs> people, people have that view. People have that view um, about having... Um, you know, less people in the world. Like I think China tried that with their one child policy, but mm. they, yeah, that didn't really work out in the long run, did it? They had too no. many men in the no. end. No, <laughs> maybe, maybe the answer is somewhere in between actually, you know, I mean, uh, by the balance, I don't think we can run a planet when every family has a seven, eight, nine, ten 10 kids, each family. I mean, we'll be that's a bit too much, but yeah, yeah. I, I don't um, know if that's happening in Australia. I haven't taken a proper sample, but I don't know anyone near me who has that many children in their family. <laughs> it's not very common. Too in expensive. Australia. Yeah. No. Too expensive. Yes. The houses yes, aren't yes. big enough. <laughs> so yeah, yeah I, I think it's. Um... And we've got the ha- the biggest houses on the planet. <laughs> we got quite a, quite a large houses here. Yeah. Oh, in Western yeah. Australia. Well, I've lived always here, so I can talk all about it. Yeah, most of Australia people, I think they build quite large houses, yeah. Oh, okay. Double stories and... Nice. Lots of space. Four by two, five by... And all the numbers, yes, yes. Mm, (laughs) Very different. (laughs) No, when we talk about numbers, it's about rent per week. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Okay. All right. Well, Okay. thank you, Ron. Really good to Mm. chat with you again. And that concludes Fusion's podcast with real voices of new members who take a chance to bank on a whole new political party and Australia's Auspol. Thank you for listening. Catch you next time.